Please welcome to the stage from the University of California, Los Angeles, Alex Bataler. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Alex Bataler. I'm very happy to be here today and uh, I'm really honored to have been selected as a DARPA riser and to uh, have this opportunity to uh, share with you a vision I have for harnessing a new state of matter. And uh, what I'll be presenting today, this new state of matter can best be described as a dense plasma condensate. And actually I have a tree for you today. Uh, this is a little bit of a last minute change, but I'm gonna try to create this uh, dense plasma condensate before your eyes. All right, do a little magic. So uh, this, this work was done at uh, UCLA in the physics department under uh, my advisor, Professor Seth Putterman, and funded by DARPA and the MTO. And a special thanks to Dr. Daniel Purdy for uh, uh, help making this research possible. So what is this dense plasma condensate? And uh, how did we find it? Well, we first found it in uh, what is known as sonoluminescence. And this phenomenon has been nicknamed a star in a jar. And as you see, uh, a bubble that is trapped in an acoustic field is made to oscillate within a fluid. And in this video here, you see a bubble that grows with a slow growth phase, followed by a rapid and violent accelerated collapse. And what happens here is the gas inside of the bubble is compressed, it's heated, and right at the moment of uh, collapse, right at the very minimum, right there, you see a fl brilliant flash of light emitted. And that flash of light comes from what is known as a dense plasma condensate. It is an extreme state of matter, and this state of matter uh, occurs when you reach uh, near liquid density plasmas and temperatures of over three times the surface of the sun. But what's quite remarkable about this uh, phenomena is that it is actually very robust and uh, not that difficult to, to create. In fact, all it takes is a simple flick of the wrist. And so let me try to demonstrate that for you all today. All right. Everyone see that? All right, do on this side. Maybe? All right. So this idea that uh, we can recreate this uh, uh, dense plasma in a quite robust way, this led me to the idea that since it's a thermodynamic state of matter, surely we can make this outside of its liquid confines and by doing so, try to use it for different technological applications. And this was the, the goal of my thesis work. And so this is exactly what I was able to do. I was able to remove the star from the jar, uh, and I was able to recreate the sonoluminescence plasma in three different ways. Uh, and the first way was through acoustically driven, using sonoluminescence and studying uh, the light emitted. Uh, the next was uh, optically driven, by focusing an intense femtosecond laser pulse into a high pressure gas, you're able to ionize and heat up this plasma to the same kind of conditions. And finally, uh, I also took it one step further and tried to do this electrically. And this is no more than a spark discharge in a high pressure gas. And in all of these cases, all three of these cases, we are able to reach the same kind of temperatures, the same kind of densities, and achieve the same kind of flashes of light. And so, why is this so uh, special for us? Why do we care so much about this plasma? What makes it so unique? Uh, the reason why we like this plasma so much is because of the light that is emitted. The light that is emitted that you saw from that, uh, those flashes of light come from what are known as black body radiators. This is a black body radiation and uh, it is an intense, um, and because these plasmas are so hot, uh, they are, uh, emit an enormous amount of ultraviolet radiation. And so why is this light source so important? The reason, to put this in context, having, say, a millimeter plasma at 20,000 degrees will radiate over 100 kilowatts of power. Now, that is an incredible light source and one that's just begging for applications. And so one of the application ideas that we have is to maybe integrate this onto, directly onto a lab-on chip for these applications, such as using this broadband light for absorption spectroscopy for chemical detection. And looking at another application idea is looking at the other side of the coin for a black body, which is that a black body absorbs all radiation incident upon it, hence black body. 
And so this could be a potential for an optical switch. And because these dense plasmas uh, are so dense that they, they have extremely fast turn-on times in the picosecond time scales, therefore I believe these are a gateway to protecting imaging systems from harmful laser attacks. And as we demonstrated at UCLA in this video up over here on the top right, a laser is made to propagate through, the, these, uh, through this gap and into a camera system. We set up a, a spark discharge and all of that light is absorbed right onto the surface of the plasma and it does not make it to the camera and it prevents any damage to the camera. So I believe that this could be a very, very uh, powerful application. And it's also interesting now that we've been able to uh, liberate this plasma, we're able, we find that we can now confine it and manipulate it in ways we, we didn't believe was possible. In, in some uh, cases, we've been able to acoustically confine the plasma away from the walls of the container. Now, this is a really big deal because now we can uh, use these for potentially for uh, plasma thruster applications. Because we can get the plasma off of the walls, they can achieve much higher temperatures and survive for greater periods of time because it's not damaging the walls anymore. And so let me just uh, wrap this up by saying that this started as just a simple scientific curiosity uh, but it has completely evolved into this new technological application that we can use for uh, all sorts of wonderful new, uh, new ideas. So with that, thank you very much, and I hope you enjoyed the talk. Please welcome to the stage, from Caltech, Anupama Lakshmanan. Good morning, everyone. I'm Anupama Lakshmanan, a graduate student from the Shapiro Lab at Caltech. And today, I would like to share with you our vision for developing cellular agents for simultaneous diagnosis, monitoring, and treatment of brain disorders non-invasively. So before I start, let me put things into perspective by bringing up this very elegant statement that President Obama made during the launch of the Brain Initiative in 2013 where he remarked that as humans, we can study galaxies light years away and particles smaller than an atom, but we still haven't unlocked the mystery of the three pounds of matter that sits between our ears. This lack of knowledge of the functioning of the human brain, especially at the cellular and molecular level, has severely hampered our de development of effective treatment strategies for some of the most devastating and debilitating uh, brain disorders that plague us today, such as Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and traumatic brain injury. So brain disorders are a growing problem that needs immediate attention. Uh, if you look at central nervous system disorders, they constitute more hospitalizations than any other disease group, including heart disease and cancer. And the global cost of mental health conditions is estimated to increase to almost more than $6 trillion by 2030. So we clearly have a challenging situation in our hands. Also, if we look at current state of the art for diagnosis and therapy, they continue to be inadequate and inconclusive, treat symptoms rather than causes, have many side effects over long-term use, and also many of these drugs are unable to cross the blood-brain barrier uh, to treat many uh, conditions within the brain. And imaging such as PET and MRI lacks molecular precision with uh, signals mostly limited to the bulk metabolic uh, signals such as blood flow. So uh, what's the solution for this? We propose cellular agents as a genetically engineered platform for simultaneous non-invasive diagnosis, monitoring, as well as therapy. So this all-in-one cellular agent-based platform basically comprises engineered immune cells, preferably from the patient's own body, that express certain proteins that help them hone to the site of injury or disease in the brain, and then we harness the intrinsic capability of a cell to serve as a molecular robot and sense its local microenvironment and produce signaling molecules such as contrast agents that can be non-invasively visualized using modalities such as ultrasound and MRI. Not only really that, these will also trigger downstream signaling cascades that secrete neuropeptides and growth factors for localized treatment and therapy. Ideally, we would also want these engineered immune cells to be able to self-destruct at the end of therapy so that there's no long-term side effects. So these cellular agents have the potential to be safer, more non-invasive, 
and enable deep brain imaging with molecular precision and substantially be more effective in real-time diagnosis and therapy. So a significant leap uh, for making this vision closer to reality is some innovation in our lab that's been going on with developing gas vesicles as genetically encoded contrast agents for both ultrasound and MRI. Gas vesicles are actually hollow protein nanostructures that are natively occurring in microorganisms such as haloarchaea and cyanobacteria, where they're used by these hosts to regulate cellular buoyancy. Not to lead to these gas vesicles, show very good contrast under ultrasound. They also show very good contrast under MRI, which makes them very versatile, genetically encodable uh, tools to be able to probe uh, the brain non-invasively using many forms of penetrant energy. In addition, uh, we have been successful in developing a proof of concept first functional acoustic sensor of calcium, which is one of the most important ions that's involved in many neuronal functions, ranging from cellular signaling to cell death by engineering of a GV forming protein. So before I conclude, I want to give you a concrete example of how our platform technology will work. So if we take the case of Alzheimer's, we have one of the pathophysiological hallmarks being amyloid beta plaques. So these engineered immune cells will first hone to the site of injury or disease, and then sense these biomarkers, such as early beta amyloid oligomers, or even elevated calcium influx at uh, high uh, or modified neurotransmitter concentrations, and then produce signaling molecules, such as gas vesicles that I've just mentioned. And this will also trigger a downstream genetic logic circuit. Here it would be an AND gate which will then help secrete neuropeptides and growth factors that help in localized treatment. So this is an interdisciplinary effort that requires uh, basically combining breakthroughs in cell-based immunotherapy, which has been uh, right now going on very heavily for cancer, and synthetic biology with our newly developed genetically encoded reporters and technical advances in non-invasive imaging technologies. So before I conclude, let me leave you with a beautiful analogy which describes what we are trying to do with this platform technology. Imagine sitting in a movie theater and watching a movie about the functioning of this amazing organ, the human brain. Instead of just getting snapshots of the beginning, middle, and end, what if we could get a continuous real-time feedback that lets us distill the intricacies and complexities of how cells communicate and also how treatment is going on. This would definitely help us not just appreciate the functioning of the brain at a basic biology level, but also come up with more effective preventives and treatments to solve some of the most devastating brain disorders that plague the world today. Thank you very much. Please welcome from Stanford University, Max Schulacher. All right, wow, thanks for the uh, kind welcome. Uh, today, I am very excited to be speaking about how we can revolutionize information technology by achieving the next 1,000x gain in computing performance. Uh, electronics truly make the world go around. Uh, and with the exponentially growing availability of big, abundant data, uh, combined with, for instance, a trillion sensors, which will soon be connected to the Internet of Things or the cloud, uh, electronics can have a dramatic impact in our lives, with applications ranging from genomics for personalized healthcare uh, to the military, uh, to science and research, all the way to security. Yet, despite this promise, there is a major obstacle, which is that the computational demands for these future applications far outweigh the capabilities of electronics today. So without improving, without drastically improving the performance of electronics, these future applications will remain forever in the future. So how do we improve computers today? Well, on one hand, we try and make a better switch, a better, newer transistor. Uh, while this is important work, uh, there are two huge problems with this. First, for many of these new technologies, we can't even build them yet. They only exist on paper. And this is obviously a major obstacle when a chip today can require over one billion with a B transistors. And secondly, even if, and this is so important, even if you could give me the best possible transistor in the entire world, 
I would still only be able to speed up these future abundant data applications by a maximum of only 10%, as the device inefficiencies themselves only account for a very small portion of the total system inefficiencies. So a second separate way we try and make a better computer is by inventing new computer architectures, uh, such as multiprocessing cores or uh, specialized accelerators. Yet this, too, also has major drawbacks. Uh, there are only a limited number of design tricks we can play, and we've played all the easy ones already. So we're quickly reaching a regime of diminishing returns. So the question is, how can we reach this target of achieving more than 1,000x gains in computing performance? Because such massive gains are required if we want to enable some truly awesome applications, such as turning the cell phone in your pockets into your own personalized doctor, lawyers, nutritionists, financial advisors, et cetera. Well, the answer lies in realizing new nanosystems, which is when we take emerging nanotechnologies, which enable new devices, new fabrication techniques, new types of sensors, et cetera, and only by overcoming questions such as imperfections can we then combine all these benefits in order to realize revolutionary system architectures, which in turn enable us to realize a whole new class of abundant data applications. Now, while each sphere of work is still important in its own right, it is only by combining the right emerging nanotechnologies with the right system architectures for the right class of applications which allow us to achieve these massive benefits. Now, admittedly, this is abstract so far, so let me give you a very concrete example. This is what a boring two-dimensional computer chip looks like today. And this is a new three-dimensional nanosystem, which has multiple layers of computing logic built directly on top of one another with interleaving layers of memory storage with ultra-dense vertical connections connecting these multiple layers, truly embodying computation finely immersed in memory. And I want to highlight for you that such a chip would be impossible to build with not only today's technologies, but more importantly, with today's conventional thinking and approaches. So how can we can build such a 3D chip today? Well, the key to enabling such new system architectures lies in leveraging new nanotechnologies. For logic, we can use carbon nanotubes, which are rolled up sheets of graphene and can form very high performance transistors. For the layers of memory, we can use emerging memory technologies. And due to the unique fabrication of these new technologies, we can build them directly on top of one another, allowing us to connect layers of logic and memory with ultra dense vertical wires. And thus it is the combination of these new, new uh, nanotechnologies coupled with the new system architectures, which these new technologies naturally enable, which allows us to achieve this massive 1,000x gain in computing performance. Now, I want to leave you with the most important message of this talk, which is that nanosystems are not just dreams or pretty pictures in a PowerPoint, but we can build them today in our labs. I'm very excited to show you the world premiere of our latest and most advanced nanosystem, 3D SmartSense, which has interwoven sensing, memory, and computation. On the top layer of 3D SmartSense, we build over one million sensors built from carbon nanotubes. And in this instance, these are gas sensors. These sensors feed their data directly into a layer of memory built directly underneath, which is then computed on with a layer of logic, which is built directly underneath that and due to the ultra-dense integration between sensing, memory, and logic, 3D SmartSense can capture an astonishing terabytes worth of information every second from the outside world and output useful information, such as extensive and accurate classification on what gases 3D SmartSense smells in the atmosphere. With that, I hope I've been able to show you the combination of nanosystems, this powerful combination of being both promising and realistic as we can build them in our labs today. So I hope that the impact of nanosystems in our lives will only continue to grow. Uh, thank you all for your very kind attention.